Hey guys, sorry about that. Welcome to the Purposeful Pantry today. Uh, before we get started, let me forgive the voice, any coughing, anything going on. I have my cup of tea to talk, my uh, citrus going in from the big citrus jar, and I'm ready to talk about dehydrating. So thank you for being here. I appreciate it so much. Uh, I can't wait to talk to you about everything going on with your lives, what's going on with your dehydrating. If you have questions, if you have comments, if you want to share some stuff, if you want to share some losses, some projects that didn't work, whatever you want to share, that's what we're here for. Uh, so let's get out some uh, some business stuff. If you entered the 100,000 subscriber giveaway for the Kasori dehydrators, please, please, please uh, go check your uh, messages from YouTube. I mean, the little notification bell to see if you've got a comment from me. Uh, go check the, the comments on the video. To the very first comment I've pinned with the, the uh, winners, it was Pam Dyer, I think, and then somebody named LL. So that's the only way I have to contact you. So if you've won, please, please check your messages. Email me at Darcy at the purposeful .com so we can chat. You have until tonight at midnight to respond, or I have to draw again for somebody else to win those dehydrators. So uh, we have the third person contacting me, but those two I'm still waiting on. And I'd hate to have to choose somebody else, although that person would probably like to be chosen and get another shot at it. So, all right. So can we start talking about dehydrating? This entire week, I'm gonna, uh, I've gotten nothing done because I have been really sick. Um, I'm still trying to get over it. Uh, and uh, then we also moved my son out of the house into a new apartment for him. Uh, he's moved in with some friends and to make way partly uh, for my dad to move in with us. Uh, and so it, it was something that God just kind of worked out that we could not have to pile people in together in our house in order to make it happen. So uh, we spent this whole week trying to get him prepped and ready to go and buy the stuff that he needed for an apartment and uh, all that kind of stuff. And then we moved him uh, Friday and yesterday and I am beat. My body is tired and I'm ready to just rest for the rest of the weekend. I won't even be doing any dehydrating this weekend because I just need to rest. So enough about me. Let's talk about you because that's why we're here, aren't it? Isn't it? That's that's why. So I'll be looking up at my big screen so I can actually read things uh, since I have a little harder time keeping track on the small screen. So hey guys, thanks for being here. Um, let's see. Hey to everyone is here. Um, so just try to catch up on the messages that are here. And uh, let's, do we have any questions yet? So before we get started, tell me what you're working on this weekend. Like what dehydrating projects do you have going on? Maybe whatever, even if you're not dehydrating, if you've got some home preservation happening, tell us, because I'd love to hear about it. Um, uh, Ellen Hendricks, uh, with mushroom soup, you can actually just add some chicken stock to some mushroom powder and some seasonings that you like, and that will make a mushroom soup. Um, you might want to do a little more. Um, I think that there is, I'm not sure if I have it. Let me go double check the post real quick. But I have this great post on my site called the um, Best Meals in a Jar Recipes that um, let me see if I have a mushroom soup. I seem to remember there's a creamy wild rice mushroom soup. Um, and I think that's the only, no, there's a second one. Nope. That's the only one right now that I have. I've been developing sort of just a plain mushroom soup um, that I'm not quite there yet, but there's that one on the website. And then a lot of times with those kind of soups and jars, it really is the recipes that you find online for regular mushroom, like any soup. Okay. Let's just take any soup. Um, you can convert it yourself without actually having to have a recipe. So if you take the quality, uh, not quality, the conversion of one cup of dried equals one quarter, uh, one quarter cup of, try that again. I'm sorry, guys, really struggling here today. One cup of fresh to one quarter cup to one third cup, depending on like the size and stuff uh, of dried is equal to about one tablespoon of powder. So if you see a recipe that you like, you can kind of make those conversions uh, and then make a soup of your own and just, collect those ingredients and then give it a try. You may find that you need to adjust things to make it more of what you might like than if you had done it fresh. You wanna make sure to keep out any dairy unless you're using dried uh, from the, from like from August and Farms or something like that or Thrive Life or any of the other kind of companies that do dried foods. Um, and then uh, those are the kind of things that you can then make work for you. So don't include meat unless it's freeze dried or unless you're only gonna keep it for a little while in a jar. Um, and that should be able to help you figure out how to uh, convert just about anything and then just make some adjustments along the way. Okay, 
There we go. Um, I'm looking and seeing all of um, all the questions. Let's see. Rose asked, "Can I use Easy Easy Liner?" Um, I'm trying to. I'm going to try to do this. She was saying something about Easy Liner for. I'm going to have to pop back up here, guys. I'm sorry. Um, easy Liner, clear Easy Liner things for the for your uh, dehydrator, and I can't catch it again. Um, hey Debbie, give me a give me a some help here. Can you either, if you see hers, can you copy it or Rose, can you post it again so I can see it? Um, it would be really helpful guys. If you have a question for me, I'm going to take this from Sutton's days, live chats that we have, uh, tag me in the question or write it all in caps. That way I can see it, uh, really quickly and easily in the, in the chat because it makes it a little hard for me to admit regular chat makes it a little hard for me to catch questions. Um, let's see. Uh, dragonflies, um, I'm sorry, you were talking to me this week about a dehydrator that's not dehydrating fully. Yeah, can't wait for your dehydrator either. Um, oh, Patty is doing some fresh pumpkin puree from Fresh Pumpkins, and I'm going to be excited for you because it tastes so good. I am about to go on my yearly quest of number 10 cans of pumpkin puree, which I haven't been able to find lately, so I bought 13 of the 30 ounce, kind of like the big cans of it. And I also do tomato puree the same way. And that once a year I dry them uh, to prepare me for the new year. Um, and I'm still having trouble finding large cans of tomato puree. I, I didn't figure I would find the pumpkin, but I can't even find the tomato puree right now in our area. Um, so I may be with a lot of small cans. I just don't want to do that because it's a lot more wasteful, but I will dry them both and then have powder for the whole year. And I do it once a year, every year, uh, just because I didn't want to have to deal with fresh pumpkins in this season of our life. That's about, that's happening right now. It's going to be about two months of kind of chaos. So, um, I do that to make it so easy on me. You're going to love it. Uh, Easy Liner Classics. Rose, Easy Liner Classics, um, I'm not sure what that is. Can you describe it a little better? Thanks, Debbie. Um, oh, Sharon, you know what? I am I am working on sort of the same project. Sharon says she is organized, she's organizing her preserving and dehydrating instructions into one notebook today. Um, I'm actually doing that with recipes. Um, I've got like five places where I keep recipes of all sorts and I really need to combine them into one just to make it quick and easy to go through. Um, I can't get it out because it's all stacked there, but I like to have one binder that has tabs for each of the like, you know, each of the main kinds of foods. So uh, I'll be doing that today. I do keep it separate from my dehydrating stuff and canning stuff, but I need to do that because I've, I've got to get all that organized um, and stuff. So I'm doing the same kind of thing this weekend with you. Yeah, we're simpatico that way. Um, somebody did ask and I'm not sure where it did, can you dehydrate fresh potatoes? Limited access, you can. What you have to do is you have to blanch them first, okay? You can't just cut slices or cubes out of a potato, then dehydrate it and have it keep its color. It needs to be blanched at least uh, for three or four minutes for like chunks and slices, a little less for hash brown, uh, or it's going to turn dark and it's going to turn like this kind of grayish brown color that's really unattractive. It's not ruined. It just oxidizes, and that's how it oxidizes. So your choice is you can bake a potato ahead of time and then try to use it, but you don't want to bake it until the point that it's just mush. Bake it just enough where a fork kind of goes into it, but it's not mushy. Uh, and you can shred it, or you can do whatever you like from it at that point. Or if you just take the slices or cubes um, and then blanch those for three minutes-ish, maybe four if you've got a bigger piece, and then dry them those, uh, that will help. A lot of people like to soak them um, and try to get out as much of the starch as they can ahead of time, but you must, must cook them or they're going to turn that gray black color that's not very attractive at all. Okay. Um, let's see. Is it um, Christine says she's got lots of jalapenos in her garden and needs ideas for them. Um, let me see. Okay. So if you're talking, because we're a dehydrator group, okay. Dehydrating is probably to me the best way to take care of, of jalapenos, unless you're going to make, um, the sweet and sour, uh, the sweet and spicy jalapeno, uh, candy kind of stuff that I can't use the real name for because it's trademarked. Um, but you can do that by canning or just dry them. So, Depending on the age of the jalapeno and how thick the walls are, you can actually dry them whole. I know these aren't jalapenos, but I just have these in storage that I can show you. You can either top them so the stem is off and then just let them dry like that so that they're like a cone. The seeds will just come out. You won't need to do anything with them. Just 
top of and put them in. You can dry them whole uh, without popping them. And it really does help to cut a slit down a couple of the sides to help the moisture come out. Um, you can puree them. Uh, just like do a really rough chop, or if you want to get even more, you know, make them almost a liquid uh, and then dry them as a, as a leather or a, a fine uh, grade. And they will be great for powder that way. Um, you can just rough chop them and dry them as bits and then use them as jalapeno bits. You can do rings. I mean, you can do anything that you normally would use a, a jalapeno for and dry them. So they're great to dry. They're perfect to dry. They go fast. They take very little. The only thing I'm going to warn you about, wear some gloves. Double glove if you can, if you've got really thin gloves, wear some gloves, uh, wear some protection on your eyes. And if you have lung problems, like if you've got asthma, uh, if you're sick, like all the things happening with me right now, uh, you must wear some face protection on your uh on your respiratory system because those oils can get in there and really create a problem. Some people even have to dehydrate them outside because the oils in the house can cause problems with a lot of coughing. Uh, it can be really strong. So recommended to go outside if you can. Okay. That all said, um, let's see what else. <clears throat> can you make potato powder from dehydrated potato cubes? And what would you use powder for? Okay. Kim, you can, um, it would be best as a thickener. It's not going to work great as mashed potatoes. Um, although you could probably make mashed potatoes from them. You might not like the quality of them by that point because they've just been so processed, but it works really great as a thickener for any kind of creamy soup um, or stews or something. You can put it in there and it kind of helps create a thickening effect on soup and stews. Okay, hold on for just a second. Uh, Patty says she's running out of room for her dehydrating projects. And it's like, if you could see my house, you would, yeah, I'm the same way. I have a pretty, um, it's not a tiny house, but it's, you know, it's, it's a tract home from the seventies. So they're all about the same size, but it was poorly designed. So we have a lot of wasted space that we can't really use for things. So we converted a coat closet to be our pantry. And then I have this bookcase right here full of stuff. And then it's like, you can see jars of things like all over everywhere, just because we just keep, you know, doing more for the for the blog and for the channel and then doing more for us to make sure we have stuff here and uh so it's just kind of taken over the house you know and the equipment in the the entryway into our house when you walk into people's entryways you expect mirrors on the wall and these nice little entryway tables with all the decorations and nice little places to put things and ours is like a shoe cabinet in this massive cabinet of dehydrators and canning equipment and canning jars and all you know all the stuff there it's like welcome to my home it's a working home that's just the way it is okay what's the best tool to use to cube potatoes that dominique asks Okay, my favorite thing to make them is just, it's called a, a, a veggie chopper. I prefer, I mean, I have a Full Star brand, but there are lots of brands out there. Uh, it is a, did I bring it here where you can see it? I only brought, I have, I like try to bring some tools with me this time that I would have them. And of course it doesn't have all the parts right here. Okay, so here's the top and it has a little plastic bottom on the bottom. Okay, so it's got a little case here. And then when you open it, Typically what we have is a grate here and then a, a platform here to help push the things in and you just shoom, and it pops out all of your cubes. So that makes it easy for me um, because it's just an easy and convenient thing. You can actually have a mandolin insert that goes in there too that some people like to use it for mandolin. I don't like that for mandolin at all. I think it doesn't work well, but I use it mostly for doing chopping. So it has cubes that are about uh, half an inch and then it has a little smaller cubes. So you can use either one. That's my preference because that's the easiest thing. I don't want like a big tool that can do that unless I was somebody who was producing that kind of stuff all the time. So this works really well for me. Um, I'm not sure, can, the, can a food processor do cubes? Food processor do cubes? I'm not sure. Maybe they can. Um, let's see. Oh, um, Sharon says she has three, what, six three ring binders full of recipes. Mm, that would be a lot to take care of. I'm trying to get mine down to one and, and one and done. That's where we need to stay. Um, let's see. Debbie says she's thinking about getting some chocolate pound cake and dehydrating that. It's so, so good. Um, it's just so good. And it goes really well with tea because... You know, you need to have that little sweet to go with it. And I am enjoying something called Kenyan Sunrise today. And it's actually really good. I hadn't had it before. Um, four jars, the, the lid company sent me this massive, massive box of Ukrainian teas um, earlier this year. And uh, it was so sweet of them. I loved that they sent it because I'm a tea drinker. So it had 
so many kinds of teas in it that I've just had so much fun just exploring them all. Um, I'm liking it. Okay, uh, LEJ asks, are there any tips for dehydrating frozen, dehydrating frozen fruit? My biggest thing to tell you is let it thaw first. Some fruits will do fine if you put them on there frozen and they're going to be fine. But most of the time when you freeze fruit, it has uh, destroyed the cellular quality of the fruit. And, uh, and it will release a ton of moisture as it thaws. So if you put it in your dehydrator as it thaws, it's going to start just releasing that stuff into your dehydrator. So one way you can do it is just let it thaw in the colander, capture that juice, and you can actually like make a syrup out of it to put in teas or like maybe create a thicken it up a little bit to put on ice cream or an oatmeal or something like that to use it. Um, and then you can expect that many of those fruits will lose some of their, their um, quality when you dry them. And I don't mean in a, in a bad way. Uh, you know how you might dry some fruits and it's got some body left to it? Well, fried, I meant the frozen might actually get a little thinner. Um, so just expect that and know that that's going to happen. Uh, use silicone sheets if you can, because it's going to likely be sticky because of the sugars, uh, but you can totally do it. Um, let's see, those fruits that you expect that have a lot of juice in them to start with are going to be the ones that are going to release a ton of juice on the way out. Um, strawberries, you can do frozen, just put them on silicone, fruit leather, kinds of trays. Um, I never rec recommend those really solid fruit leather, fruit leather trays that are done by um, Nesco and Kasori and some of the other ones that are like really hard rigid plastic. I would use something that you can peel like a uh, Teflon sheets that I like to use or silicone sheets, whatever, whatever you've got, because you can actually pull things away from that that might get sticky. And, and that, that was more information than you needed. I'm sorry, but that kind of, those are some of the tips for doing frozen. And then be prepared to wait it out because it's going to take a while to dry. Um, let's see, I'm going to try to get to, I don't know if I can catch anything. If I haven't an answered your question, you answered it very early on, please repost it by tagging me at the Purposeful Pantry. That way it'll tag me on here, uh, or put it in all caps so I can see it. Um, okay. Peggy says that she's just about, she's taken out all the rest of her, uh, cauliflower and zucchini from the, um, from the dehydrator after the fall. Um, uh, Tammy Lee, I do have a couple of pepper videos. One is doing sweet peppers. One is doing regular peppers. One was doing like a mixture of them, uh, of, of the peppers, like the hotter peppers. So there are quite a few in there that I've done recently, even that are on peppers. Mm. Um, and then let's see, is a follow-up, uh, Christine about drying the whole. Now you need to remember really thick walled peppers do not dry well, uh, whole. You will need to slice them a lot to get the walls broken up so that the moisture can get out. So if they're really old, uh, and really thick, you'll want to go ahead and chop those up. Um, and, uh, peace, peace be still. Can you dehydrate frozen peppers? You sure can. They just pour them out and dry them. Um, Oh, Matthew, the handheld food saver is great in small quantities. Can I just say that after quite a few years of experience with it now? Do not expect it to do a jar like this. It will not do it well. You'll need a, a more powerful vacuum or you'll want a brake bleeder. Um, but those little handhelds don't really handle big, big jars very well. And if you have something in here that is... Um, really bulky, but not dense in how much space it takes up. It's going to take it a while to get to work through all that air. Like, um, like say if you were doing pasta, I know this is a tiny jar, but do you see how much space is up here where the pasta just can't compact at all? If you do a whole big jar, even a, even a quart jar full of pasta, that little handheld will take a while to get through it. So I really like it for smaller jar sizes, not for really big ones. Cause I think that's just where it, it it's great and it's perfect for reselling things that you're in and out of a lot. That's when it works the best. Um, but if I were to use it for like everyday vacuum sealing for all the things, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have it as my main source of vacuum sealing. But I hope you enjoy using it because it does work really well when it works on the things that it works well on. It's really, really good. <clears throat> okay, let's see. Louise asks, the temperatures have dropped and I have 30 pounds of onions to dehydrate and a, a 
Daytime temp should warm back up to 50 F by the end of the week. Can I dry outside uh, if I bring them inside at night? I don't know what your nighttime temp is going to is going to be. And if it's if it's down below 40, I you can do it. But the thing about dehydrators, when you work them outside and the air they're bringing in is so cold, um, it takes a while for that heater to get that air uh up to temperature. So you are working your dehydrator a little harder um, and you're not gonna be drying at the same temperature necessarily as you have it set for. Now, typically it doesn't matter because those things, you don't have to have a particular temperature except if you're using proteins. Uh, so you're just gonna dry them a little less and they're gonna take longer to dry. And as long as you don't pack them heavily, uh, it will still dry well. Um, just know that it's gonna take a little more for your dehydrator to work, especially if you're working on a lower end dehydrator. Um, I would just be, you know, it would be fine. So if you need to bring it in at night, that's fine. You can leave it out if it's protected. Um, but if it's going to get like below freezing and stuff, I would go ahead and just bring it in. Um, and even if you turn it off, you can, um, if you can put it back in the refrigerator overnight, that's the best food, you know, food handling that you should do. But I'm not going to turn an eyeball if you decide just to bring it in, leave it off, uh, especially if you have a cool place to put it and then put it back outside the next day if you choose to do that. Okay. I hope that helped. Um, Dominique, um, let's see. I can't link to the particular chopper, but let me do this really quick for you. Um, I have where I keep all of my recommended dehydrating tools or even the ones that I use. Um, I have a link for that right here. Let me get it. Uh, it's not letting me do that. So we'll just do it this way. I'm going to put the link in the comments, but it's also down in the description box um, that if you're on mobile, you have to open up the little arrow to drop everything open. And then down there is the link to the store, but I've also put it here. So if you go into there, it's going to have it linked and it's a full star vegetable chopper. Um, Let's get to the next one. Oh, Peggy, yeah. Ras Peggy dehydrates raspberry leaves, strawberry tops, lemon verbena for winter for winter teas. And yes, they're all great. All right, can I can you dehydrate blackberry raspberry plant leaves uh, into tea with a dehydrator? You certainly can. If it's edible, it's eligible to be dehydrated, okay? Just pretty much any green leafy thing that you can dry that's edible or drinkable in the case of tea things. Yes, you can totally do that. Um, hey, Deb, do you mind if I uh, make you moderator just for, for right now that you can catch stuff for me um, if you wouldn't mind? <clears throat> and if you don't want it, then just let me know. Um, does it matter if different foods are dehydrated on different trays, but at the same time in the same dehydrator, for example, pepper, fruit, and eggs? Okay, Rebecca, I'm going to tell you up front, uh, I don't recommend doing eggs in the dehydrator, especially if they're raw and especially don't mix them with anything else. But uh, what you don't care about is time. Okay, you never have to care about time. Don't even worry about the time part. What you care about is the temperature. Eggs need to be done at 160 and above to be safe. Even if they're cooked, they need to be done at a higher temperature to keep them safe. So you don't want to dehydrate anything else with that because then you're losing nutrients. You might have case hardening in some cases with things that dry so fast on the outside with those higher temperatures that the inside can't dry out. And so that you have things that you think are dry that really aren't in the center. So I don't recommend doing eggs at all. And I wouldn't do fruit and peppers necessarily because you want to keep aromatics separate from everything else, just in case. Uh, many people can combine those things and they don't really transfer flavors, but you're talking about temperatures. Um, and there is a slight chance that if you're doing bananas and peppers together, that those peppers are going to take on a banana flavor um, or the other way around. So what you want to do is do vegetables together, fruits together, aromatics together, which is peppers, onions, garlic, uh, those kind of things. And then you want to keep um, mushrooms separately and protein separately. So if that helps you, then there you go. Um, but of course, you can experiment in your home to figure out which things might work fine together. So I will often do fruits and vegetables together and then keep them at the same temperature, lower, because I like to keep things a little lower. And they're fine. They don't have a lot of transfer. But especially in the beginning when you're learning and trying to figure it out, keep them separate to keep them safe, uh, not safe, 
to keep yourself from having to run into that issue. Um, but I'd never suggest doing eggs with anything else. Um, how do you dehydrate pumpkin? Um, Calabasas homes. Okay. Pumpkin can be done a couple of ways. Um, the best way to me is just to throw it all in the oven, uh, uh, cut it in half, scoop out the pulp and the seeds, separate the two and you can put the pulp back in, um, roast them without any oils. You don't need to put oils on them, roast them, puree them whole. If you want to, you could actually de-skin them if you prefer, but you could also do the whole thing. It's all edible, uh, puree it and Put it on sheets, dry it, and then create a powder from it later that you can then turn into pumpkin puree anytime that you need it. Or you can do cubes. You can shred it. Um, there are all sorts of ways. It depends on how you're going to use it in the end. So think about that first, and then you can do those other things. But it's really easy to do. It just can be a little messy. Um, Dragonfly says, I figured out the pre-frozen onions don't smell as bad. Yep, that's what I've been telling people. You know, that's the good thing about frozen in a lot of cases. With garlic and with onions, frozen does not smell anywhere near as much as fresh because something about the freezing process, breaking down all the stuff and the oils and all that kind of stuff just makes it to where it doesn't smell as bad um, and makes it a lot easier to have to prep because you don't have to sit and cut it all. And uh, so I, I totally go after that frozen stuff um, because it just makes it easier for me. Um, I just missed one, something about an advantage because everything jumped. Is there an advantage? Um, advantage to hydrating zucchini slices versus shredded. Janet, again, it depends on how you plan on using that in the future. Okay. Uh, slices. If you're going to put it in soups and stuff and you want the bigger pieces, then that's how you're going to want to dry it. If you want to have it for making breads, if you want to have it for more powdering, if you want to have it for just adding to something without a lot of the flavor, shred uh, is better because you can compact it better. It It's it's more versatile, but it just depends on how you plan on using it later. Um, I like shreds because they're easy to get done. Just put them through a food processor. If you have one, shred it up, spread it out, dry it, and you're done. Um, and it's easier to store. But some people like to have cubes or slices in as chunks of things in their soups and stews. So that may be why you want to. So there's no advantage except for the fact that how you have to think about how you're going to use it later. Um, okay. I always do that um, right before every question. I'm really sorry. I have. I fell in gaps that way. <clears throat> How does a person dry things without a dehydrator? Love hugs. If you have an oven, you can dry it in the oven. The best recommendation I have is to dry it at the lowest temperature that it goes. Some don't get below 170 F, which off the top of my head, I can't convert that to C. But uh and it's not quite low enough. So they'll pop, you can pop open the door with like a wooden spoon or some kind of oven mitt that's safe for the heat to allow uh, the, some of the heat to escape and allow the moisture to escape. Uh, you can do that. If you live in an arid environment where there's not a lot of humidity, you can actually dry outside or in your car or use the sun. There are solar dehydrators. There are all sorts of ways. Air fryers can even dehydrate. Um, they're not the most efficient. You don't get a lot done at one time, but they work if you happen to have one of those. Um, Rose, the easy liner, clear classic shelf liner, which is what you're talking about. It, it may be food safe, but it, I don't know about the heat. So, um, I don't know how it will react to heat. That's the problem. Um, it's not meant for heat, so I probably wouldn't use it. Hey, Robin, welcome here. Uh, you, you may have been back. Yep. Okay, Ellen Hendricks, what do I recommend for slicing potatoes for dehydrating? It's totally going to depend on what you have available. Um, I happen to have, okay, there are a couple options and I, I brought some, some, some tools just in case. Now, if you have a food processor and you don't have gigantic potatoes or you don't care that they're not in full whole slices, a food processor is probably going to be the best way to slice anything because it's just going to be automatic. You just keep pushing stuff through and it goes and it's no problem. If you happen to have the space for a big meat slicer, it's probably going to be easier to do one of those, okay, because it's just a good tool for larger projects. Um, I have no space for 
a meat slicer. That's one of those things I would love to have, but I don't. So the other thing, if you're not great with knife skills, which is going to be, you know, no tool required, you have a knife, use your knife. Um, but what you have next is a mandolin. And before we start with any kind of mandolin that you're going to use, even um, no matter what, get a safety glove. For it. Don't get the fabric ones because they don't work. Um, trust me, they don't. Uh, these are not chain mail, but they're kind of like a chain mesh um, that are made. They're cut resistant gloves that you use for like people use for meat cutting. Um, they will work great to protect your hand that you're using to slice with. Even if you have a guard on your uh, mandolin, that guard will not protect you when your hands slip, when you're cleaning, um, when you're not paying attention and you reach down to do something quickly, it will not protect you because the guard is not meant to protect for more than that initial thing. But I've slipped off of it because your hands get wet. Use a glove. All right. So a mandolin works like this. If you don't have one already, it's like this. And I'm going to keep my hand way out here. You just slice down with your potato and slice it and just keep slicing it. It just cuts off slices and you can adjust how thick everything is with this right here. Although I recommend the quarter inch is pretty standard for everything. Then you have something like this, which is called the dash mandolin. It's a safety mandolin. So it's like you can get the same kind of result, but you use a plunger um, like this. So you have a little chute that's right here that I didn't bring over, but it holds the vegetable and then you just plunge it and you can see where that it's like a guillotine kind of effect. Okay. The problem with this, um, even with the shoot on, it is not foolproof about not cutting yourself because when you're cleaning it and trying to get into the crevices that are near that blade, you still expose yourself to a blade. So you have to be really careful. And also with the way the shoot is, you only can do vegetables that have about that big of a diameter hole. Uh, if they get much bigger than that, you can't do them whole. You have to cut them. And so if you want things to stay a whole circle, it doesn't work that well. Um, but this is great for doing all sorts of uh, I can do three carrots at a time within it. So I'm cutting three carrots. Um, things also don't necessarily cut straight. They have a, a bit of an angle to them. And so if that bothers you, then, you know, that's a thing. But it really is. Um, a lot of people really prefer to use this. I'm doing that wrong. Put it down. Prefer that because it does keep you much safer than a standard mandolin. So those are the things that you can use to cut potatoes. And you can use to cut carrots and um, any kind of tuber. They work really well. Okay, let's see what else. Um, Sue, the built-in dehydrator on an oven is great. You're just going to have to be careful with it because it does it. Um, it can, um, unless you have a good fan to move that moisture out, it can it can be where you still have moisture building up in it. So. Sometimes you might want to crack that door, even with a dehydrator function on a fan, because basically what those mean is that they just have a temperature that goes down. Uh, if it's got the if it's got the convection oven to it, it may have a fan that works automatically. So, yeah, you can do it that way. And then I do recommend getting um, like a cookie sheet. No, not cookie sheet. Um the cooling racks that you get for cookies, you can use that to put on your your shelves in your oven to help mimic a dehydrator shelf. Robin asks if you can make safe bouillon in your kasori. Sure, uh, dry it. If you're doing meat or chicken, I mean, if you're doing any kind of beef or chicken, um, just make sure that you're drying it hot. Um, I know that you've already cooked it by the time you get to that point, but just to be on the safe side, dry it hot. Um, and it's safe, okay? The problem is the storage later. Um, beef and chicken have fat. And even if you've def defatted all of your bouillon uh, or broth, you're still going to have a little bit of fat left in it and fat can turn rancid on the shelf. That is the problem with storing beef and chicken on the shelf. Most of the time is the rancidity that happens when the meat starts to turn bad because it oxidizes, the fat oxidizes. So it's recommended to store it in the freezer to help stop that. So if you want to make bouillon and if you want to be totally safe about not losing it to rancidity, just store it in the freezer and you're going to be fine. Or you can store it in the fridge too. Now that doesn't mean that you're automatically going to get rancidity on the shelf. It means that uh, it's a possibility and it's a real possibility. And instead of wasting all of that time and effort and money to create those things, just to have them turn bad, storing them in the freezer kind of keeps you safe across all 
all those issues. Now, there are plenty of people that can store that stuff on a shelf and they've never had a problem and that's fine. Um, you do what you want to do in your own home. But when I, you know, in teaching this to, to help you realize the things that could happen, it's mostly to help you realize that it's a lot of time and money and effort wasted if the things go rancid and if you didn't get it defatted completely in the beginning and all of those kind of things. So yes, you can safely do it to store it properly. And it won't have as long of a shelf life as other foods do because, because it's a protein and because of that fat issue and all those kind of things. <clears throat> uh, Dominique, thank you. Dominique is saying thank you for how I uh, package my stuff to go to go back. Okay, let's see what else. Um, oh, thanks, uh, Debbie, for reminding me. Yeah, I do. Um, I do have a video on dehydrating vegetable stock and then dehydrating the vegetable stock vegetables because while they've lost most of their nutrition, there's still flavor there. And then you could go ahead and dehydrate that and then powder that up, and it's a good flavor. Um, or you can just keep the crumbles and put them on top of like a potato a baked potato, that would be good too. Um, but yeah, you can totally do stock. It's really easy. Um, Stedman, yeah, that would work with garlic too. Now, now garlic may not work as well as frozen onions do. He, um, Stedman asks, is, does the freezing trick work on garlic? Um, garlic may not work as well as onions. Um, I haven't done frozen garlic, have I? Have I done frozen garlic for you guys before? I can't remember. Um, it doesn't break down the same way an onion does because the cell structure isn't the same, but it does help. Do I have any recommended dehydrating Bibles for beginners and intermediate? Do I? I don't know. So I might have something out there for beginners and I don't know. Kim, do I? Um, Kim, actually, I do. Thanks for asking. This is the Dehydrate, Dehydrating Basics Journal for Beginners. Uh, it would work for anybody who needs to know how to dehydrate because this isn't necessarily a book on teaching you how to dehydrate only. Okay. What this book does is it has loads of information in the beginning on the dehydrating basics about how to dehydrate, how to store, what to use, all that kind of stuff. And then what it also has are these awesome journal pages that are the techniques on how to dehydrate a ton of stuff. So I give you the recommended time and temperatures, although remember time doesn't mean anything. It's going to take you much longer than the times given because your circumstances may be different. Then it gives you all of the instructions. It gives you tons of space to write notes about how your project went, what you wanted to do in the beginning, um, and about what you might want to do later. Uh, it gives you tips on storage, on serving, or on prep that I didn't fit in here. Then it gives you a place to write your yields, um, how much that it worked for you, because not just because I say a quarter cup is worth a uh, cup dried, um, it may be a little different for you depending on how you did it. So uh, that way you can write your yields in. You can just take all kinds of notes. This is um, my dream book for what I needed from a dehydrating book before, after I bought a ton of them. And then there in the end, I've got some recipes. Now, that's not to say this is the only book that you should have. Um, there is, I don't have them handy. Let me get them real quick. I'll be right back. My recommendations for dehydrating books, that's not one of them, is um, this is my number one recommendation, The Beginner's Guide to Dehydrating Food. And the reason I recommend it above all others at this moment, especially for beginners, is that it has tons and tons of before and after pictures, okay, or after pictures at least. So that is really helpful for some people to see what it's supposed to look like because the words don't necessarily translate. So this one is really good. It's there. Um, then there's the Ultimate Dehydrating Cookbook right here by Tammy Gangloff. That's a great book. And you can see I've always taken notes. The, she doesn't have photos for most things either, uh, but lots of great information. Then there is, let me see, I didn't even grab them all. There's the Mary Bell Dehydrating Book, um, the Dehydrator Bible. Uh, and then uh, off the top of my head, those are the best ones that are out there. I have a video if you want to go search on the site uh, on YouTube, a video of me going through a bunch of them and, and thumbing through them so you can see it. And then on my website, if you look up Best Dehydrating Books, I've got them listed uh, with links to them and, um, and more information about them all. So if that helps you, 
then there you go. Um, I'm not going to say that mine is exactly like theirs because I went after that journal aspect because that's the thing that I thought was missing in the whole market of uh, reference books is that you have all these great books, but not any room to write. And then what if you have things that you want to do differently, then you're tracking note pieces of note paper or whatever all over. This made it contained in one spot so that you could take notes and do all those kind of things. So my book is available down below in the description box. I've got links to it. It's also on my website, The Purposeful Pantry. Uh, just hit the little shop button and that's where you can go. All right. So thanks for the plug. I know that you didn't plant that. It's not planted. It was just like, going, oh, I just so happen to have something that just might work for you. Okay. So next question. Does, oh, that was it. Um, let's see. Daniela says, I'm about to attempt making potato powder to add to soups to make or to make mash from it. Am I best making mash to dehydrate it? Yeah, you would be best to go ahead and make your mashed potatoes if you want it to be mashed later without any fats and without any seasonings. Just do your mashed potatoes. Um, some people bake them and then mash that. And then some people just make mashed potatoes and then spread that out and then flake it. And that's what you've got. Uh, that would be the best thing. Um, let's see what else. Uh, thank you, Debbie. I appreciate it. Um, Limited access suggests using a dishwasher brush to clean your mandolin cutter. Um, I find that I still have to get in there sometimes, even without a brush, because I've got a couple of brushes that would work, and I don't find that they work all that well all the time. So just always safety first when working with blades all the time. <clears throat> Sorry, excuse me. Gina, I know photos are so helpful. Um, I wanted to put them in my book, but it would have made it so expensive I couldn't do it because I'm self-publishing instead of going through a publisher um, that I couldn't do it and still make it to where you guys could afford the book um, because you know, even cutting my profit from it, which I've done already a ton uh, to add that to it, it would have just made it way too expensive. Let's see. Oh, thank you, um, Camper Fish, Fisher Lady, Camp Fisher Lady, Camper Fisher Lady. Sorry, sorry, I'm having a little trouble seeing that stuff. Um, I'm feeling better than I was earlier this week, but I'm still not done. It's this is kind of hung on. It it wasn't the big thing. It wasn't. Um, pretty much. I don't know if you guys were at live last week. Um, I I turned off the computer, walked outside, and just got slammed with whatever this is. It hit hard and fast. Um, we think it was an allergy attack because at the same time we had a big front that moved through that that pretty much killed summer for us finally. Um, and it happened all around the same time. So we're thinking it was an allergy attack that has just turned, you know, into whatever all this stuff is. And it could have just been a cold that was at the same time, but um, it just kind of hung on and won't let go. Um, sticker fam, uh, I did answer that email. She asked, or he asked, I'm sorry. Um, I think it's she, but that's just an assumption. Um, can I safely dehydrate Costco mint garlic that's in a jar? Yeah, you can, as long as it doesn't have oil. Um, if it's not, if it's just the minced garlic and water, it's fine. Just spread it out. I've got a video on how I did that. If you want to look at the channel, um, that I did just that kind of thing and it works really well. Okay, did I catch up? If I if I skipped your question, if I didn't see it, please type it in again. Uh, tag me at the Purposeful Pantry, then ask your question, or uh, do it all in caps, um, and that way I can see it. Lucille Hall says, I have beautiful onion powder, but it clumps bad. Is there anything that I can do? Okay, here are a couple of things. I have, I'm, I'm sorry to keep referencing you, but then I have this, you know, I've written these in order for you to be able to read it later so that you can go to it whenever you need to. Uh, but I do have a clumping uh, post on my website, the, the Purposeful Pantry. Uh, just do a search for clump. Um, here are some things you can do. Break it out, you know, get it back into a grinder if you can, break it up, put it back in your oven and allow the oven to dry out your powder. It takes care of any of the moisture that might be there because every time you open the jar, you're reintroducing moisture that's from the air that gets in there and then you close it up and you've got this moisture that's gonna make it clump. It's also full of sugar because onions are naturally full of sugar. Not in the same way that you would think, you know, a glass of sweet tea is, but it's got sugars and those sugars are hygroscopic. 
um, and they absorb, they attract moisture like crazy, which is why they clump so badly. So turn on your oven to its lowest, lowest temperature, let it heat some, then turn it off. Put your onion powder on a piece of a cookie sheet with some parchment paper to make it easier to pour out later. Um, <clears throat> sorry. Um, and then just let it sit there and dry. And it's going to cr like crust over the top and you're going to think it's still um, clumped and it's not. It's just It just takes the fingers to kind of get it loose again. You can do that. You can mix it with some arrowroot powder to help let it work as an anti-coagulant. Uh, so it, that's not the word, an anti-clumping agent. And um, and that will help stop the clumping. Um, and for most things, it won't matter because you're adding it to things that will use arrowroot powder anyway or can accept the arrowroot powder. You wouldn't want to put it in like a clear broth because the arrowroot powder will actually help cloud that up a little bit so it won't stay clear. Um, but those are some of the things that you could do. And I also have that post if you want to go look at it and it's got some more ideas. But it can be unclumped, but just garlic powder, onion powder are two of the worst ones. I mean, even commercial grade, even with the additives that they put in theirs uh, can clump over time. So also don't open your jar and then, and then pour it out or do something right over a steaming pot of anything on your stove. Do it away from your stove and then transfer that into whatever you're cooking because that moisture will get into the jar pretty easily. I hope that helped. Um, <clears throat> hey, Tammy. Welcome. Welcome in. Amy, uh, Amy asked if, if you're using dried tomato slices on pizza, do you rehydrate? That is totally up to you. You can rehydrate it. You can put it on there like it is make your pizza and enjoy the kind of chewy texture that it has. Um, I prefer it that way. If I'm going to do those big slices, they're really seasoned, uh, but you can rehydrate it if you want to. It's just what your texture quality preference is like in the end. You can try it both ways and see what you like. Um, love pup, pugs, um, water from boiling potatoes, just like water from pasta has a lot of starch in it. So it's a really good thickener to use. I uh, know Dick Gardner. Yeah, I'm uh, allergies everywhere. I think that as weather changes and, you know, things happen, you, you get new patterns coming in. I've never been affected by an allergy attack like this before. Um, my son, my oldest son gets them once or twice a year. He's just allergic to everything. It seems I've never had this happen, which is why we're not sure it was allergies. It was just right when this front came through. I walked out as it was coming in and it was really windy and blowing stuff everywhere. So uh, this could just be me reacting and overreacting to whatever was in that air. Um, the only thing I know that I'm allergic to is um, evergreens. And we don't have a ton of them in our area, but you know, who knew, who knows what blew in from someplace else that could have done it. So, but I'm sorry, you're suffering from it. And I hope you feel better soon and that it doesn't affect you all that long-term. <clears throat> oh, thank you, dragonflies. Yes, when you powder things, um, don't powder them for storage, powder them for a short term use. So if you're powdering, if you've like, if you've dried a ton of onions and you're, you want onion powder, keep the larger jar of onions whole, then powder as much as you think you're going to need in a month or so. Uh, and if you have to do it again soon, you can kind of adjust it to, to figure out how much you're going to use. That way you, you keep the nutrients and the flavor in the larger pieces because they store longer and you don't run into that clumping issue of powder in a jar that you've got this big jar of onion powder and then it just keeps clumping because it's so much to handle at one time. Um, I find some things are okay to be powdered in large quantity and don't have an issue. Mushroom powder is the one that I go ahead and powder up crazy in the beginning um, for what I'm going to use for a long time. Uh, green powder is also something that I do in large quantities because we go through large quantities. So I don't have to worry about it just sitting there losing all the nutrients over time because we go through that stuff like crazy. So I will do a, a quart size jar at a time of green powder. <clears throat> Hey, Barbara, welcome to chat. J.L. Mitchell said, um, loves my book. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. It means a lot to me for you to say that. Uh, and um, did 14 zucchinis into coins with toppings, purchased uh, an oxo mandolin with a mesh glove. That's right. Do that mesh glove. Protect yourself. <clears throat> Tammy, um, that old K-Tel, 
for 450 is a great deal. Now, I don't know if it has a heat feature on it or not. I don't remember if those old k were air only or if they were jerky. So um, what's going to happen with it, and it's great to use, so I'm not going to try to dissuade you from using it. That's not how I mean for this to be, okay? Uh, whatever you can use to dehydrate your food and put it on your shelf to preserve it for the future, do it. They can either not have heat, and so you don't want to do some things on it because they can mold, like berries, uh, and maybe even tomatoes can mold if they don't have a good, um, a lot of air movement to help get them dry, even if those really super low temperatures are none with just the air dry. Or it can be really super hot because it was a jerky dehydrator and you're going to want to protect from things like, um, like tomatoes and uh, any kind of cubed things that you do, or even berries if you've not broken them in half or, you know, like really taking care of the breaking that skin um, can be case hardening. Um, also, the higher temperature that you go, the more of the, the heat volatile vitamin you're going to lose. So pretty much you're going to lose all of your A and C, which you know, ultimately it doesn't matter because you're not eating fresh fruit. We, we get plenty of those vitamins and other things. You're going to keep a lot of vitamins. You're not losing everything. You're only losing those heat vol volatile ones up front. But studies have shown that the more heat, the longer term you use, the more of that you lose. So I would think that with most dehydrated things, never count on having ANC, okay? Um, but the higher temperatures that you use, you just lose a little bit more of everything. So you don't want to overheat things if you can help it. The lower the temperatures that you have, the more of all of those vitamins that you keep. Love pugs, you can store potato, I mean, the starch water, you can freeze it, but it's not really something that you want to preserve by canning or by, um, I know some people might try to dry potato starch, but that's not how you do it. You have to actually boil that down a lot to get down to the actual starch, and then you can dry it and then have potato starch. Um, but I don't find it's worth doing. It's one of those things that unless you use a massive quantity of it for stuff, I don't find that that is a good use of dehydrating time. Um, Elizabeth, don't be scared to, to can. Okay. I'm gonna, I'm speaking to you as a 50, 50, almost 58 year old person who wouldn't can for years because I was too scared to do it. I was afraid that I was going to make my family sick. When I finally did it, I cannot believe how much time I wasted of things that I could have had shelf stable for all of these years because follow the process, follow what the National Center for Home Food Preservation says to do, and you're going to be fine. Follow the process. Get started. Pull out your canner, put some water in it, and, and can your water because that gives you some practice of doing something without the risk of ruining something, which is the thing that you're always concerned about, that you're going to ruin food and waste all that food and money, or that you're going to make somebody sick. If you use water first, just put your cans in with water. Don't even use lids. Just put them in. Run through the whole process just like the process says to do. You can get some experience under your belt before you start doing food. Um, and for me, I wish that I had started with chicken the very first thing I did. Raw pack chicken is the easiest thing. You cut it up, you throw it in, and you're good to go. You don't have to add anything to it. You don't have to do anything to it. It's so easy to get started on. There may be some other projects that are just as easy, but I found that that, was, that should have been what I started with in the beginning, but I was too chicken too. Eh, too chicken too. Yeah, I cracked myself up. But take the time to read the directions, walk through the process, you know, kind of picture it in your brain, write it down. Um, I have a checklist on my website. Lisa Sutton has a checklist on her website that you can have printed out that walks you through the process. Um, and then just do it. I promise it's going to be worth doing. Don't, don't be too scared of it. Oh, lots of people commiserating about what it's like with their allergies around their, their area. I'm sorry for you guys too. Um, Dawn, do I have a dehydrator that I recommend? Do I ever? Any dehydrator that you can get your hands on that you can use is what I recommend. Okay. Because it's, if you get it and use it, that's going to be the dehydrator for you. Now, the other part of this then is how much money do you have to spend? How much space do you have to store it in? How much volume are you trying to get out of it? Um, then those are the things that you have to think about ahead of time. So there are very few dehydrators that I've ever used or been exposed to that I would say never get. Most of them are the ones that are really cheap. 
Um, and so the recommendation I have for things that are um, around the 100 to 50, 100 to $150 mark, um, the Kasori um, six tray, which is the stainless steel dehydrator. Uh, I don't have it in my, it looks like, no, you won't even be able to see it because I've got the big one turned sideways. Um, it is a six tray dehydrator that if you live in the U.S. and want to purchase it through my link, I have a deal for $128.99 from Kasori's home company. Um, that's about the cheapest that you can get it unless you buy a warehouse deal from Amazon. Um, it is a size, it's about this big ish. Okay. It's easy to put on, on, on most people's countertops. Uh, it is, it works really, really well. Um, and I think it's probably one of the best deals on the market for a dehydrator. Then you also have a Nesco, which is the stackable kind that is around, um, that you can stack up. And depending on which model of Nesco that you get, you can actually stack it up to 30 trays. If you're going to do a lot of volume, um, that's a good one to get. It's around $100, 100 to 120 depending on what the market is at the time. It used to be only 60 but, you know, when 2020 came, they got expensive because everybody was buying them. Um, then you have so many versions in between. There is um, there is the Colzer. There is a LEM. There is the Cabela's large ones. There's the Excalibur. Um, oh, gosh, what else? There are so many out there that are just fine. Um, what I wouldn't do is buy one from um, Aldi. I wouldn't buy one from Hamilton Beach. I wouldn't buy one from... Uh, it starts with a G and now I've forgotten the name. Um, it's not Gourmia. It's another one, I think. Um, there are some lower end ones that have really cheap plastic in them that doesn't last. And they're not the best dehydrators, but that's just from the user end. It's not like it can't work. It's just that they don't last because that plastic is really cheap and ages over time and can break. So those are my recommendations. Um, and I hope you find one that's good. If you need more, if you have more questions about it, I have a blog post on my website that's called Best Dehydrators. You can just search for that in the, in the search um, and it will kind of walk through them all. It has links to them if you need to use them. Um, but it also just teaches you what to look for to see what's going to work best for you because you've got you've got the build, you've got how many trays you want, the kind of trays and all those kind of things. So that can help you if you need it. But I'm going to tell you, get one and use it. That's going to be your best buy. Robin says, thanks for teaching her how to preserve and that mushrooms are her favorite thing to dehydrate. And that's right up there in the top of my, uh, my projects too. We do a lot of mushrooms all the time. In fact, um, the last teaching video that you saw from me was doing mushroom bits, which is what we use now more than anything. Um, I just do a rough chop on them and using my vegetable, my vegetable chopper, cause I didn't try, uh, the food processor. I don't want tiny, tiny bits. We want a little bite to them. And I did a two, almost two quarts worth this last time, and they're going to last us no time at all. I'm going to be doing that again soon. Um, we use a lot of those. Okay, Granny Hebert Hebert says, do, do, do dehydrated apples get crispy, or do they only get leathery? Okay, what you have is both. You want it to break. Okay, so it's not going to be crispy like fried, like the things that you get at the store are either freeze-dried or they are fried. Um, oftentimes what you want is for it to break easily for storage. I mean, we're talking for storage. Okay. And they're going to have a leathery texture on the outside, but you want to be able to break them because you want them fully dry. Now, if you're wanting for just a snack on, um, you can have them at whatever dry texture you like, but if it's not fully dry, I would recommend storing them in refrigerators in the refrigerator so that they don't mold over time or get really soft and kind of weird um, on the shelf. So if you're going for storage, fully dry, uh, be able to break it. You're going to have a leathery texture on the outside, leathery and dry. If you did it with the skin on, uh, it may take a little longer to get there because that skin can be one of the things that kind of holds moisture in, um, but that's how you want it leathery texture on the, on the surface and then be able to break it. <clears throat> uh, Miss Sharon. Yeah. It's, it's, you know, my age is not an excuse for anything, but I, I focus more on the fact that I just wasted all those years my grandmother canned 
um, or one of my grandmothers did. And she didn't do a ton of canning. She would do canning in the summer when they had extra green beans or when the peaches, oh, the peaches, I hate peaches. Um, there's a whole story behind that. But um, when peaches would come, she would do those and she would can some things. But I didn't care back then to learn from her. And then once I cared, when I was a young adult, uh, she wasn't canning anymore. It meant she had quit that a long time before. And then once I got older and really cared about preserving, I wasn't around anybody who uh, canned. And I wasn't, YouTube wasn't around yet. And so I just put it off for a long time and just said, I'm not going to do it. And I didn't have anybody to help teach me. Um, and then once YouTube came and I started watching, it was like, no, I just can't. I'm going to make all my family sick if I try this. So I just wasted all those years for so long. They could have done so much that I just want to kick myself in the butt for um, the peach story. Cause somebody might ask and you know, I'm going to say it anyway. When I was growing up, I would go spend a week or two with my grandparents every year. And they lived down in uh, just north of San Antonio, right by Fredericksburg, Texas, which is in the hill country. And it's like the epicenter of peach growing in Texas. Um, and every summer we would make a day trip out to Fredericksburg to go pick peaches. And I evidently am overly sensitive to the peach fuzz. So we would, you know, I would be in two layers of long sleeves and we're talking about the height of summer, you know, in Texas, two layers of long sleeves, gloves, um, something around my neck, a hat and whatever. And I would still come home just incredibly itchy from all the peach fuzz. And it was like the kind of itchy that's not just itchy, but I was reacting to it. So I would have to go take a shower and then I would still have to go in, in the kitchen with her after and help and help process all the peaches. And I hate them because of it, because I just, the memory of what I felt like and then having to do the work of it after and not even liking them all that great, all that much in the beginning. Uh, and then just really hating them. And I don't like peach anything. I will, I will, if I come to your house and you serve me peach cobbler, I will eat some to be polite, but I hate it. I hate the stuff. I just can't eat it. And of course my kids love it. So, because of course, <clears throat> um, Angela, I am of the opinion that electric pressure canners are not safe, uh, are not tested for safety. Um, no matter what they say and no matter what they slap on their box to say that they're tested. They're not. They're not tested by independent laboratories that can prove that they've kept their pressure over time. Um, and I choose not to use them in my, my home. What you do in your home is your choice. I just don't promote them myself. Until we get some independent testing that says they're okay, um, I'm not a big fan because I tend to be overly cautious that way. Although I'm telling you that Presto Electric Canner makes things look easy. And it makes things available to people who can't get pressure canners. So I'm not going to put judgment on people for using it. Does that say what I want to say? I'm, I don't support them yet, though. That's that's why I'm not going to promote them myself. <clears throat> Little Urban says, uh, Homestead says, raw packing uh, cube meat is also great. Um and as an easy first canning project, that does work too. Uh, Kathy, again, jump in and do it. Follow the process. Watch some videos on YouTube by trusted people, okay? Find the trusted people. Um, there are quite a few of them out there. Um, I'm not going to name them all because I'm going to offend somebody from not doing the right canning things. But Sutton's Days, Simple Canning, um, Tulu Creates, Linda's Pantry. Um, there are dozens out there that are really good and safe and will walk you through the process and show you how to do it. Watch them. I meant watch them a few times. Just go through the process. I've done a few canning videos um, and you can watch mine, but I'm not the expert. So I'm sending you off to the experts. Um, Debbie, I don't know if you do any. Um, I say that because I watch some of your stuff, but I'm not sure how many canning videos you have yet. But um, follow the process with somebody that's good and then you know and see how it should work, and that will help you a ton. And then read those instructions on NCHFP quite a few times to get yourself ready, and then just go do it. <clears throat> Excuse me.
Let's see, what else do we have here? Okay, Elizabeth, you said that you bought a Barton 22 quart stainless steel pressure cooker and have a GE glass top electric stove. Um, if you're talking about doing canning in that, you cannot. It's a pressure cooker. It is not a pressure canner. They are not the same thing. You can pressure cook in a pressure canner, but you cannot pressure can in a pressure cooker. I hope that helps. Um, and you don't want a large, um, you need a canner that is a flat bottom for a glass top stove. And you still need to check with the manufacturer of your glass top stove to see if it is rated for, for canning. Not all of them are. So you need to double check that before you even start canning on your glass top stove because too much weight, too much heat trapped in that spot can actually cause it to crack and they're expensive to replace. Um, and with some of them, with the way electric stove tops work, the glass tops work, they cycle. Um, and some of them in their cyclical process, you can't keep the pressure up in your canner. Mine does. I've tested it. It While it cycles off, my pressure stays steady enough to be safe with canning um, because I'm watching the dial and know where that pressure is. But if your cycles to the point of that it starts to lose pressure, then you're having to start over a project and it's not worth doing. <clears throat> All right, so Jolene Jackson asked, can I dehydrate chuck potatoes quartered? Um, I would not recommend doing large chunks of any vegetable. Sure you can, but the problem is, is that if they take forever, you run that risk of, of um, case hardening where they're there for a long time, the outside gets really hard and dry, but the inside can't dry because it's too large. I would really look at doing smaller pieces. Quartered, depending on the size that you're talking about, you know, a quarter of a, of a potato can be this big um, in a chunk. So um, I don't recommend anything over an inch for dehydrating for best uses. If you want it bigger than that, uh, go to canning. I missed a question there from Alex. Sorry, um, I missed a question there somewhere about storage for something and I don't know. So sorry if I missed it, but ask again if you need to. Um, Texas Lady, get hot in Fredericksburg, just like it gets hot everywhere in Texas, isn't it? Um, we're still looking at 90 today and um, those couple of days of nicer weather, just, it's like today's just like, ugh. and we moved in this yesterday with my son, uh, and it got pretty miserable yesterday afternoon. It was only about 90, but it was still like, but it's not supposed to be 90. It's like mid October. We should, but I know better. You can't really count on fall weather in Texas until it's like November. Um, Kathy, don't tell me that. We're about to get H-E-B and I cannot be, I cannot even tell you how happy I am to finally get one. I loved H-E-B when I was living in Central Texas um, and miss it. And I miss it when I moved back up here. And we had Central Market, um, which was an upscale, not upscale, but it was like a different version of H-E-B that I really love, but it's too far away to make a, at a regular grocery trip for us. So um, we're going to get an H-E-B soon and I am so, so excited. Um I'm so excited. I can't tell you how excited I am. More than I was when we got an Aldi finally. Um, okay, Alex, you cooked and dehydrated turkey. Um, it's okay to store it in a jar, but you, but like I said earlier, if you weren't here, I'll explain it really quickly. Turkey has fat. Even if you use low, you know, 90-10 turkey, it has fat. So when you dehydrate it, even when you cook it, you're not getting out all the fat. And if you store it on a shelf, especially if you uh, if you didn't rinse it really well to try to get out all the fat you can, you run into fat rancidity over time, which is why we don't recommend putting uh, meats on the shelf, that they're better stored in the freezer to protect them from that thing that could happen, which is fat oxidizing, which means when you open it up, you can smell it, that it just smells gross or it has changed color. It's a protein. You certainly um, can choose to store it on the shelf, but the best place is to store it in the freezer. OK, uh, you may get some time out on the shelf and you're going to be fine, but it's one of those things that it's your choice how you want to do it. I hope that helps. 
Oh, I need some water. I didn't bring any extra water with me. Um, let's see. Okay. Barb. Barbara Carlson asks, is there a way to figure out the carbs in apple slices if cut with a mandolin? I love dried fruit, but I'm diabetic and dried fruit is so high in sugar content. Barbara, the carbs in any fruit, in any food dehydrated are exactly the same. You do not lose carbs. So whatever a slice of apple is fresh is going to be a slice of apple in, uh, in dried, but in a smaller quantity. Okay, so if you have a cup of apples... Um, a quarter cup of apples dried are the same carb, the same carb content. They don't lose the carbs. So you have to watch that with diabetes. So it's, doesn't matter if it's sliced or cubed or whatever, they keep the carb count. So in just a smaller portion size, because you've dried it down, you've removed the moisture, but you just kept all the sugar and carbs in them. <clears throat> All right, guys, I'm going to go ahead. We've been here for a little over an hour. And if we don't have any more questions, uh, I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up for right now, just because I'm starting to feel like that cough is coming and I've had it um, here. Um, so um, I hope that you guys have enjoyed it today. I hope I was able to answer your question. Um, if you have any others, you can always a, a email me at any point in time at, the, at Darcy at thepurposefulpantry.com. You can catch my Facebook page, The Purposeful Pantry. If you're not part of the dehydrating group, it's Dehydrating Tips and Tricks, um, where we talk about dehydrating all the time. Debbie, thank you for, for popping in as moderator today. Um, and I just want to say thanks, you guys, for being here. I appreciate it so much. I hope that we were able to help you um, get your questions answered. And until I see you again next time, happy dehydrating. Sorry. <coughs> Bye.